Well, I think I'm a little late. But this is the East Asian Observatory and they are in charge of the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, JCMT, which is a sub-millimeter uh, sensitivity system. I'm very interested to come in and find out what they are all doing. Hello, Steve. Hi, no, no. you're at uh, James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, right? I am indeed. Yes. So what <laughs> the is best that? It is the best telescope around. I've actually. heard it's the coolest telescope in the mountain. Uh, it is certainly one of them by a variety of definitions. <laughs> 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 yeah, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope is the uh, the largest dish that's actually near the summit of Mauna Kea. So a lot of people think it's Keck, but we actually have the winner. So <laughs> yeah, because you're working in a different wavelength range. That's correct. Yeah, we work at sub millimeter wavelengths, which means that uh, I'm one of the few astronomers I can hold up my fingers and say the light is about that big it's, that I look at. <laughs> it's really like real, like seven hundred uh, microns. Yeah, around 450 oh, to 850 okay. microns. Okay. Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, visual light is much, much smaller, so uh, we need a larger telescope to look and at the larger wavelength. And this really behaves like light, because I mean, you know, 100 times longer wavelength, it's like microwaves, you know, yeah. it's going through walls, but this has uh, issues with going through the atmosphere, there's certain windows and... Absolutely, yeah, yeah, we, we uh, uh, take advantage of two uh, really good windows, one at 450 microns, one at 850 microns, and we also do some observing around 1.1 millimeter. Uh, outside of that, though, it's very very difficult because most of the light is blocked through our own atmosphere. And even it, when you're on the top of the mountain? Even when we're all the way up there. So uh, it helps being uh, uh, up on the top of Mauna Kea because you're only at about 60% uh, of the amount of the atmosphere. So what I'm interested in observing, what many people who are interested in observing with the James Clark Maxwell Telescope is uh, star formation, gas and dust in our own galaxy and in other galaxies that is going on to form stars. Uh, so this is early on in the cycle where the cloud is collapsing and it's not that warm. So the wavelengths that there is emitting in is are still pretty... That's exactly yeah. right, yeah. Uh, paradoxically, stars form in some of the coldest places in the universe, talking about only... 10 degrees above absolute zero or 10 Kelvin or so. So uh, these, this cold dust that we're observing is, is, um, uh, is something that our telescope is specifically tuned for. What cool things have we seen then? <laughs> so there are a variety of cool things that we see in the telescope. Uh, the JCMT is really famous for discovering something called scuba galaxies. Uh, scuba is not named after one of our favorite pastimes in Hawaii, but it's actually one of the instruments that used to be on our telescope. These are uh, galaxies that are, you know, far, far away. These are uh, 12 billion light years away. We've detected some of these star forming galaxies, these really active galaxies. From the very early from part of the, the universe, right? Really the beginning of everything, uh, effectively. And so uh, there's a lot of people who look at these galaxies and try to figure out the star formation history of the entire universe. Um, myself, I'm, I'm interested in things that are a little bit closer to us in our own Milky Way galaxy. And, uh, Effectively, my research is about how <laughs> uh, 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 how baby stars get fat. Uh, that's that's what I try how to baby figure stars out. get fat. How they actually grow in mass. Yeah, that's what I'm interested. Yeah, in. I mean, that's because that's a paradoxical thing. Is once this thing turns on, it starts to push the stuff away, right? Yeah. So uh, that's one of the things that I'm really interested in studying. There's a big shift right now in the kind of paradigm of star formation, where we think we have gas and dust collapsing onto these young stars and young stars growing smoothly. Unfortunately, there's a problem with that. Uh, if we follow the math exactly, every uh, baby star, protostar in the entire galaxy that we observe is about an order of magnitude too faint. The theory is not actually matching the observations currently, and we're trying to solve that right now uh, by a, a program that we're leading at the JCMT. Okay. So, just some specs on the telescope. The dish, you say, or it's a dish mirror, I've heard it described both ways. <laughs> we usually use dish uh, when you get out to these longer wavelengths, uh, but it is a mirror, it reflects light, just like uh, you could imagine. Yeah, it is a 15-meter uh, dish that we funnel light into a variety of different receivers that we have at the back of the telescope. And so, like, how many pixels do you generally get out of a... Uh, so, for instance, uh, the, the instrument that I usually work with is called SCUBA2, or the Submillimeter Common User Bolometer Array, because you know, we have to have acronyms for things. But the uh, SCUBA2 has 10,000 pixels at the back, and these are supercooled to 77 millikelvin all the time. 
So it's one of the coldest places that we cold. know about in the universe. Wow. So this is like what <laughs> helium, uh, yeah, helium, a, helium three, helium phase? three. That's exactly what we use. Yeah, it's a, it's a four stage uh, uh, cooling process that we use to get all the way down to near absolute zero. So you've gone full exhibit. You have coolers for your coolers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> that's how these things work. Our biggest problem really is the atmosphere. So because uh, the atmosphere is a lot warmer than the sensor. That's right. And and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, water vapor is one of those things that our telescope detects really well, but we would prefer it not to because we want to see things that are past the water vapor in our atmosphere and out actually into space. So, so. you have to pick your thing. I mean, so this is about as good as you're going to get inside the atmosphere. There are space telescopes that do the equivalent. But. Yeah, there's some space telescopes. For instance, uh, there's uh, also SOFIA, the uh, the, the flying oh, yeah, observatory on the 747. Uh, on yeah. the 747. They look at more uh, infrared wavelengths or a little bit shorter wavelengths than we do, but this is the best site in the world to do what we do. Right. I mean, you, so be clear that there's a long way between these submillimeter wavelengths. There's a lot of infrared in between that <laughs> invisible. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, the, uh, a variety of uh, different well, fields a, a of astronomy. Three magnitudes yeah. of astronomy of uh, or orders of magnitude in terms of wavelength between yeah. optical and submillimeter. Yeah, that's right. And they're all um, essential because uh, in in each of their different ways, we're able to take um, different pictures of the same objects that show us different physical results, uh, and that shows us a, a broader picture of what we're actually studying. What I like to say is the biggest picture. One of the most uh, exciting discoveries that we've had recently is from something called the uh, JCMT Transient Survey, and that's actually looking at protostars that are still deeply embedded in their gas and dust. And we're actually trying to take real-time images of these protostars bursting when material falls onto them. So we've actually caught several of these in the act now, and we found a periodic protostar that bursts every year and a half, which we think is connected to a planet orbiting around. And this is kind of uh, shifting our, our paradigm of star formation to when planets form and how early they form uh, in, the, uh, in the history of a star. So it, it, yeah, the disks start out kind of uniform and they get clumpy. Mm -hmm. And then the clumpiness can lead to variability on very short times and also periodic. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, so we think that uh, protostars don't gain their mass smoothly. We think that they uh, gain it in uh, little bursts that uh, a lot of material falls onto the protostar. This is kind of like the difference between, you know, eating a 12-course meal where you really have to pace yourself over time, <laughs> or if you go home on the weekend and watch Netflix and binge eat uh, all of the Oreos in the house. And I think that protostars are the binge eaters out there when people think that they're the 12-course diners. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're seeing evidence right now of this material being blocked, possibly, by planet going around a very embedded oh, early Oh, so there could be star. a stream, like almost like a river of material coming in, and then this planet orbits through it and cuts it off? Absolutely, yeah, and we can actually watch this protostar bursting with our own data that we get here that, at JCMT. Okay. Yeah, it's quite incredible. That, that's actually really cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Thanks, Steve! Thank you so much, Thanks Scott. for telling us about the coolest stuff. <laughs> well, hey, it is cool, yeah. <laughs> Hello, and now we are with Jess Dempsey, Dr. Jess, from the East Asian Observatory, correct? That's right, yeah. Wow. So, uh, give us a lowdown. All right. We here uh, at the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. He's the guy who invented light. He's Scottish, uh, you know. He is, he is. And it was, um, actually, I only found out the other day why. We called it the JCMT, James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, because it was inaugurated on the... 200th anniversary of his birthday, actually. Wow! 19, yeah. uh, 1980, well, 1979, which is when it was conceived. We're one of the oldest telescopes on the mountain, and we're also the biggest because size matters. The size does matter. But yeah, I mean, Jason, you know, James Clark Maxwell performed this great unification of physics. It must be a pretty cool telescope to have his name on it, right? Oh, we're very proud. So <laughs> we shouldn't be allowed to use any more acronyms, though. I believe they should be banned in astronomy. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> TLAs, I'm a big fan. Oh dear, well yes, unnecessary acronyms, or tortured acronyms yes. in astronomy. <laughs> we have a lot of those. Anyway, yeah, what we do is sub-millimeter astronomy, which is the one of the hardest and, and silliest kinds of astronomy to try and do from the ground. It's, it's hard and therefore silly, right? That's right, There's exactly. There's like three places in the planet you can do this. Exactly, yes. so one of them happens to be here on Mauna Kea, um, and the other two are Chile and uh, Antarctica, the high Antarctic plateau. And that's because if you have more than roughly two millimeters of water in the entire atmosphere between you and space. In the entire 10 tons of atmosphere between you and space. If you condense right? that down and you've got more than two millimeters of liquid water, 
none of that radiation from all of these interesting objects gets down to us. Wow. So it needs to be incredibly dry. It also needs to be incredibly cold. And that's because this radiation is coming from the coldest uh, and darkest objects in the universe. You need to have your instrument colder than the radiation that is coming in to hit that instrument. And this means that we're looking at things which are only a couple of degrees above absolute zero. Yeah. Some of the earliest things in the universe uh, and the, the most distant galaxies, for example, um, maybe only a you know, very, very tiny bit above that background. So that means we have to cool our instruments down. In one case, we have the coldest instrument in the entire Pacific. And Pacific it, is a big place. It is, <laughs> and I'm fairly confident of this one. It's actually 50 milli degrees above absolute zero. And that's, it's insanely cold. And because th although there are lower energy photons that are collected in the name of astronomy, they don't come from black body radiation generally. That's right, right. So you have to, so these things are fascinating objects and they're really new science. We just didn't have the technology. Uh, to detect this radiation mm -hmm. up until about 30, 40 years ago, which of course the first thing that they accidentally detected in this wavelength was the, the afterglow of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And we've gone on from there. These first instruments about 20 years ago, we would have been happy to have a one pixel camera. Yeah. That Just having one pixel to get that cold would have required an instrument about the size of this table. So JCMT has the first camera of uh, uh, any size uh, was SCUBA was called mm. and it had uh, about 600 pixels. 600 uh, pixels, not megapixels or kilopixels, pixels. 600 pixels and so now like, we have Scuba 2 with 10,000. So that's like 100 by 100. Yeah. And, we're pre and that thing took us So how big is that hours. sensor, the actual the, sensor the area? The sensor is only about this big. Right, so that's like you know, 12 inches across maybe? Yeah, maybe a little less. However, the instrument itself is about two thirds of the size of this room. You, you, you don't go buy this stuff off of the shelf. No, right. unfortunately, as much as I wish we could. I mean, this is the only uh, one of its kind that's ever been built and, and probably the only one that will be built. And when we turned it on, because of the energy requirements to keep it that cold, uh, our electricity bill went up by about $15,000 a month. And I'm guessing you can't just turn this off either. You've got to keep it at that temperature, right? When we have a power outage up there, we panic. We can keep it cold um, for about 40 minutes. Oh, and wow. then it will warm up. It takes us a full three weeks to walk, to cool it back down again. So any outage, just yeah, you have backup generators and or we no? cannot get no? a generator big enough to <sighs> absorb that power. So no, we don't have a backup for that. It gets pretty exciting up there during our power outages. We've been talking about flywheel replacements. We've been we actually is having some conversations like, right so, now. So so the energy it. is required. I mean, can you put that in like kilowatts or oh megawatts? Oh my goodness, I could convert it, but it's thousands. It's thousands of kilowatts. That's a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing there's like big radiators that you're on the side of the building or something too. Well, I mean, how do you, how do, how does that it, cooler even work? We, we actually joke it looks a lot like you know the movie Brazil, the Terry Gilliam movie. I love that movie. And you're going to hear lots of squeaks and pops and whistles and and there's lots of very steampunk going <laughs> everywhere and. And every time we had trouble doing this cooling, we would add another compressor, we add another chiller, <laughs> and these things are everywhere. It's, it's not an easy job to get something that cold and then keep it that cold. Wow. Uh, and you can only naturally cool down to about 4 Kelvin with any liquid we have here, right? Hel helium is as cold as you can go. Yeah, you do go helium and helium-3 and they evaporate. Yeah, and so then you have to start doing really funky physics with, with these. Um, uh, and so I get mad every time I see a helium balloon. It's like, damn it, we have more important things we could be doing with this helium. <laughs> I'm sorry, I may have inhaled helium on one of my videos. Oh, that's but all right. It's no, for okay. science, that's more important. It was for science, you know. <laughs> Hello, I'm Scott Manley. What's the coolest thing that we've been seeing with this lately? So the, the really huge thing um, that we're going to be doing with the JCMT is called the Event Horizon Telescope. So as you get longer wavelengths, you get poorer resolution on the sky. So we can't see these tiny, tiny, gorgeously resolved stars uh, in the same way at the sub-millimeter because you have to make a bigger telescope. Mm -hmm. So to get the kind of resolution we need to see these things, you need a telescope the size of the Earth. Oh. So we went, okay, let's do that. And that's exactly what the Event Horizon Telescope is doing. Uh, using very long baseline interferometry. Okay. Uh, so knowing very accurately where two different telescopes are, and they can be thousands of kilometers apart, looking at the same thing, we then later 
correlate those signals, collect them, and do some functional So you're collecting the phase information from that's these right. l l wavelengths? And okay. that's right. And then we combine those. And what happens, the most amazing power of an interferometer is they act in the resolving power on the sky like a telescope, which is the same, the same size as the distance between them. So the second telescope for this will be in Chile, or...? We have ALMA in Chile. Okay. We have the, uh, the Large Millimeter Telescope in Mexico. We have the Greenland Telescope, which is actually on the edge of Greenland, and we have the South Pole Telescope. So they're all going to work together in this range? We have a 9,000 kilometer baseline telescope. And that's what you need to do. We're actually only looking at one thing. We're actually looking to image for the very first time the black hole at the center of our Sagittarius A star. And has never, we've, we've inferred this through all sorts of other different methods, but we now are expecting to see how the dust and gas, which is being distorted and shrouding around this black hole, that's what we're going to be imaging with this telescope. And you can only do it at this wavelength. So the gas that's falling in is pretty cool until it starts to get close. And I starts would to get heated up. But the point is, it's still really small. Yeah. And so you need to have a telescope this size before you can start looking at how that dust and gas is, um, it is being distorted by the black hole. And by looking at what that shape is, we're going to be able to tell you how some people think it's rotating, some people don't. So whether there's a disk around it, uh, all of these things will come up. Yeah, I have to. I mean, I visited Sagittarius A star in a video game, but uh, <laughs> I want to see how accurate it is. To be honest. Well, I'd be hoping they'd be updating that after. Yes, the, the, they are very good at it. So, because the the guy that makes the game is a bit of an astronomy fan. Excellent. Well, we'll we'll send him uh, the first paper when we get it out. Ah, oh, he would love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's that. That is really. I hadn't realized you were doing this. Yeah. So, cool. Jess, Doctor Jess. Oh my God, really? Thank. You. I hear you also have these uh, snow I globes. Do. Yes. Yes. Proving that you are the coolest telescope we, in the we, mountain. We do, and I don't think anyone else has snow globes or anyone not as cool as these. Yes. It Would has, you like one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you, you know, now you feel too polite to say no. <laughs> I, I have to. It is polite to say no since they're very limited. 